I know the last time I saw my father alive, three months before he died, about five years ago, I was in Australia visiting. And my father said to me, do you have any particular specific memories of 50 years ago? I said, well, what year are you talking about? It was like 57 years ago. I said, well, I'd have to think what grade I was in at elementary school. But yes, I'd probably have some memories. He said, he said no, I mean specific memories. My father was a non-believer. Anti-God, anti-church, anti-everything. He was the leader of half of my family who were in that faction. I said, you know, honestly, I can't think of specific memories. Do you have something on your mind? Share it with me. Oh, he said, no, it doesn't matter. He wouldn't do it. I said, you know, it's more important for you to share than for me. I have hopes of living on for a while yet. He wouldn't do it. So I said goodbye to him, firmly believing I would never see him again, and I was right. Anyway, my youngest sister, who was his great favourite, came in a few hours later, and he told her what was on his mind. I'm sure he knew that she would immediately call me. She has a voluble mouth, my youngest sister. If we want to spread anything in the family, we just call her, you know. <laughs> and, and I love her dearly. She and I have a great relationship. There are six kids in our family, and she's the youngest of them all. Anyway, she called me up and she said, do you want to know what Dad was talking about? I said, absolutely. Well, all those years ago, my father came home drunk one night, which was his habit, and he beat up our mother, knocked her unconscious. She's lying on the kitchen floor. I can still see it. Then he filled up the kitchen sink with water and pushed her head under it. And I, being the oldest son in this whole family, I was terrified. There were six kids in the bedroom looking on, terrified. So, without thinking, I ran out of the house a quarter of a mile down the street to the police station and I reported my own father, hoping that the police would come and take him off to jail, get this brutal man out of our house. And the police came in and did the one thing that we did not want them to do, they beat up my father. So he's lying on the floor too now. We've got two parents lying there. And my father said to my sister, that was the most humiliating moment of my entire life. He was selfish to the end. No concern about the impact this could have had on any of his children, only concerned about the fact that he had been humiliated beyond belief. So when my sister shared with me, of course, the whole experience came back into my mind. I just hadn't been thinking about it. And I recalled it in detail. So I asked God for wisdom what to do. God says, well, you can't apologize for doing the right thing, even as a child. But you could let your father know how sorry you are that he has spent the last 50 years of his life without a son. And you have spent 50 years of your life without a father because my father was totally offended by me all those years, especially when I became an Adventist preacher. Couldn't handle it. So I called up my father and I said, I, I've had some memories about 50 years ago. Oh, he said, you've been talking to your sister, haven't you? I said, of course, you knew I would. <laughs> you knew she would. He said, so do you have anything to say to me? He's expecting an apology. I said, you know, Dad, I've been thinking about the whole event and I have a great regret in my life that I've spent 50 years without a father. We could have bonded. We could have had a mature adult relationship. There's so much I could have shared with you about what's happening in my life and my family, but you've missed it all because you've spent 50 years without a son. And I've spent 50 years without a father. What a tragedy. So I said, I have a suggestion to make to you. He says, gruffly, what is it? I said, well, do you think you might be big enough to let this go? I've decided to drop the whole thing. I'm asking you to be big enough to let this go 
because no matter how many weeks or months you've got left, there's still some time for us to bond together before you die. I will make a commitment to telephone you every day for an hour and we'll see if we can do some bonding in the time that's left. We've got 50 years to catch up on. But you're going to have to be big enough to let it go. Do you think you can handle this or not? I knew that would challenge him. So there's a silence on the phone. I'm holding on for about two minutes and there's not a word. I know that he's thinking very seriously. And finally he utters those incredible words. He says, why not? I said, hallelujah. <laughs> what a breakthrough this is. Why not? He said, okay, go on, speak to me. <laughs> what do you want to tell me? 50 years worth, go and tell me. I said, oh. And we talked for like an hour and had the most beautiful discussion, the first decent discussion I'd ever had with my own father. And I was about to hang up, my father says, hey, 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 you're not hanging up, are you? This is a man, by the way, who has resisted any attempt on my part to minister to him or to pray with him or anything all these years. I said, well, yes, I'm hanging up. We've been talking for an hour, as I promised. He said, aren't you going to pray with me? I said, oh, hallelujah. <laughs> I said, I'd love to pray with you. He said, well, go ahead and pray with me. Every day until three months later when he died, he said the same thing. You are going to pray with me, aren't you? I said, absolutely. Amen. And as I prayed for him each time, I could just feel his heart warming and opening up. Anyway, he had a serious attack. He was very diabetic, among other things. And he was taken off to the emergency ward from which he would not return, two o'clock in the morning. My mother was trying to telephone him because he used to live in one of those units where he had some care. And my mother was trying to reach him. She knew something was desperately wrong because she couldn't raise him. At two o'clock in the morning, and my mother has a huge family. She has 58 grandchildren. You could say we're a very productive family, you know. Because <laughs> one of my brothers, as some of you know, has 25 children. That helps a great deal, you know. With his, he's polygamous, he has three wives, but that's another story. <laughs> and he's not a Mormon, <laughs> but he does live in New Guinea. Anyway, my mother began to think, who could she call at two o'clock in the morning? And she thought of one of my nieces, her granddaughter, who was my father's favourite. So just on the chance, she called up Meredith, my, grand, my niece. And she and her two brothers, all married people, but they'd been away together for a spiritual retreat weekend. Two o'clock in the morning, they were driving back home, and guess where they were passing, as she called them? They were driving past the very hospital that my father had about ten minutes to live, had just been taken into. So they turned their car into the hospital and raced in, and his favourite granddaughter arrived to have three minutes with him before he died. She's an evangelist, this girl. She put her hand on his head. She said, Poppy, are you frightened? He said, yes, I am. She said, would you like to die with peace of mind and, and trust in God? He said, yes, I would. Amen. So she said, I'm going to pray a little prayer. Would you repeat it after me? And she apologised to God for all those years, those 85 years that he managed to live without admitting his need of God and begged forgiveness and claimed faith in the blood of Jesus. And he said the very last word and smiled at her and closed his eyes and died. And I said to myself, wow, what a gracious God we've got, haven't we? 85 years of resistance and three minutes left. And what does God do? He sends your favourite granddaughter. That's pretty good out of 58 grandchildren. <laughs> she happened to be driving by the hospital at two o'clock in the morning. Not a coincidence, huh? Not a coincidence. I've left him in God's hands. He's in God's hands. But my heart was greatly lifted up as I realised that 50 years of misunderstanding melted away just because God gave me the grace to call up and say, Dad, I'd like to let all this go. Let's spend the remaining time growing together in love and bonding together. And he took the opportunity and did it. Isn't God gracious?